Thank you. Uh, on behalf of ADB, a uh, very warm welcome to everyone joining today to join this webinar uh, on transforming higher education and serving future learning societies together with National University of Singapore. Our higher education systems have been undergoing major metamorphosis in recent times, being shaped by many mega trends and developments, not least from the flow of digital technologies, COVID-19, and climate change. Many, many trends are shaping these transformations. Earlier this month, I read that a Space Foundation in the US launched the Space Commerce Institute by the Center for Innovation and Education with the aim of filling the innovation gap and building the workforce needed to meet the growing demands of this, the space commerce landscape with growing number of university students, entrepreneurs, and professionals in this domain. So we're really looking at a very exciting future times when so many innovations are happening and so many new domains of study are opening up. Uh, we have a very eminent panel of speakers today from different countries and with diverse background and who are luminaries in their own sphere of work. So they will weigh in on this discussion today on the future landscape of uh, tertiary education and transformational trends. And what are the most important streams of reforms and development and initiatives uh, that are required in the university sector. Um, but before I get to the speakers, I would like to request uh, uh, Bruno Carrasco, Director General of Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at uh, Asian Development Bank to give his opening remarks. Uh, Bruno leads ADB-wide knowledge, innovation, policies, and strategies in all thematic and sector operation areas of ADB and ensures compliance with ADB, all of ADB's environment and social safeguards policies. Thank you, Bruno, for joining this event and over to you for welcome remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shanti. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to open this forum with the National University of Singapore on transforming higher education and serving future learning societies. I welcome and thank uh, Professor Susanna Leung, Vice Provost of the Lifelong Education uh, at the National University of Singapore for joining us today. We are indeed delighted and privileged to have a wonderful panel of speakers today uh, from some of the world's top institutions. We warmly welcome Professor Otto, Professor Suchia, Professor Kong, Professor Vea, and Professor Hassan. Thank you very much for making it today. We look forward to hearing your insights and your perspectives on how universities can be leaders of change in human capital development. This is a very opportune time to discuss the reimagining the role in educa of education and training particularly in the context of accelerating digitalization, spread of disruptive technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, shifting labor markets, demographics, and of course, important trends such as aging, climate change, and of course, COVID-19. Uh, in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, uh, we thrive on three key aspects of our work, knowledge, partnerships and innovation. And in many ways, we build on developing partnerships such as uh, the ones we have today uh, with National University of Singapore and inviting leading distinguished experts from the field to help us shape our own ideas in how to support uh, a stronger, more prosperous, inclusive, resilient Asia and the Pacific. Now, one could say that uh, we are in some ways in a new global disorder and not just because of the recent uh, COVID-19 disruptions, but also because of the increasing unpredictability in terms of the way forward. Uh, Shanti has highlighted some of these key points. Uh, we're certainly looking at much more complexity and uh, some of the simpler, more predictable uh, solutions now need to be revisited. Uh, we need to be much more agile, much more nimble, much more responsive, and we need to develop a lot of the new tools to enable us to, uh, to be able to meet uh, these increasing demands. ADB's uh, long-term strategy, Strategy 2030, 
promotes intersectoral approaches and synergy across sectors and themes, such as education, health, urban development, transport, climate change, gender, energy, water, agriculture, and finance. And many times the old narrative, the simpler challenges that we seem to be able to address have suddenly become much more complex. Uh, many of the solutions require to address that complexity and that often at times requires integrating much more across sectors, across themes. And that's part of the work that we try to do uh, given the breadth and coverage of areas at, at ADB. We believe that uh, human capital is an effective connecting thread. ADB's operational priority one on addressing remaining poverty and reducing inequalities proposes, uh, again, an integrated approach to education, health, and social protection. Now, turning to uh, our pipeline of development projects, um, we have right now in the education pipeline over $4.5 billion uh, worth of investment projects uh, for 22, 2022 through 2024. This includes support uh, to all levels of education. The share of tertiary education in total ADB loans and grants for education has grown and significantly. And this is a, an important area, both education and health, where we want to be able to contribute and have a greater voice in this area. And it's grown from about 12% uh, of the current portfolio um, to about 34% uh, as far as pipeline of projects for 2022, 2024. So you can see the increasing importance of, of this sector uh, to, to our work at ADB. And this, of course, reflects a growing demand for advanced skills and research and innovation. So it all comes together. Going forward, uh, I do hope to see great collaboration uh, on education and training for climate change. Um, ADB is now styled as the uh, Climate Change Bank for the Asian Pacific. Um, and uh, we have now set a new target uh, for climate financing of $100 billion of own resources between the period 2019 to 2030. Um, this has been a strong commitment uh, led by our president, uh, President Asagawa. And this is a, a very important agenda, but education is also important. Uh, and it's important for many things, including for behavioral change, but also for building the technical and scientific capacity to effectively uh, address climate change. The pandemic has also shown the critical need to rethink the role of higher education in workforce development, innovation, and of course, entrepreneurship. There is a great opportunity to facilitate the partnerships that I mentioned earlier between advanced universities and developing universities in the region in important areas such as climate change, digital transformation, and workforce development for education and health. This uh, will certainly help improve the quality of teaching and research, uh, as well as private sector partnerships. The Tokyo Convention provides for internalization, interna internationalization, excuse me, of higher education in the Asia Pacific region through mutual qualifications recognition. Uh, the Bologna process in the EU is a long standing example that Asia and the Pacific can certainly uh, learn from. We look forward to hearing the experiences from our distinguished panel today, representing, again, leading universities. ADB sees itself as a solutions bank that entails financing on the one hand, but equally important knowledge. And we are keen to build and transform ourselves more into a knowledge bank that can provide better solutions across the range of our countries in the Asia Pacific. Um, Many thanks again for sparing your valuable time to join us today. Um, I wish you a very inspiring dialogue this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno, for setting the stage for the uh, upcoming discussions. Thanks a lot. Now I'd like to welcome Susanna Leong, uh, Vice Provost of Master's Programs and Lifelong Education at the National University of Singapore. Susanna is responsible for initiatives and programs on continuous education and training in, in NUS. You know, ADB and NUS have had a long-standing 
knowledge sharing partnership across different domains. And we are delighted to take this forward. Uh, Susanna, you've kindly joined our flagship events at ADB. And uh, I turn it over to you for your welcome remarks. Susanna. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Shanti. And um, a very good afternoon. Uh, I am Susanna Leong, and I'm from the National University of Singapore. I'm most delighted to be here today. First, I would like to thank ADB for the opportunity for NUS to be part of this uh, webinar um, with um, the panel of very distinguished um, speakers and panelists on the topic of transforming higher education and serving future learning societies. And for me to make some opening remarks. Next, I would like also to offer my heartiest congratulations to ADB colleagues on the publication of a new book entitled Powering a Learning Society During an Age of Disruption, which provides useful insights to the roles of multiple stakeholders in strengthening the fabric of education and training for future societies. Indeed, um, as um, Director General Bruno has, has, has mentioned in his opening remarks, we are living in extraordinary times. We are experiencing the effects of Industrial Revolution 4.0, that is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. At the same time, the world has been battling a pandemic in the last two years that resulted in disruptions in almost every aspect of our lives. We are all learning to live with the virus and adapting to the new normal of hybrid working and learning. As universities, leaders, and educators, we know our graduates are being thrust into an operating environment which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And they will have to tackle new problems which are multifaceted, demanding solutions that must be drawn from various dif different disciplines. At the same time, we are mindful that our students do not have the luxury of resting on the skills and knowledge acquired for the undergraduate degrees for the rest of their working lives. Given the increasingly short half-life of knowledge, some shorter than the rest in certain disciplines such as computing, medicine, and engineering. Nor should they want to. Life expectancy today means a long professional career, and we are all living longer and having to work longer. Being able to respond to change and to grow, mature, and gain new skills means greater potential for job satisfaction and reward. How can we, as a university, help our students and graduates remain competitive and relevant in the workplace throughout their careers? As educators, what do we know about the future of jobs? What are our responses in terms of our own transformation to meet these challenges. Uh, I'd like to share, at NUS, we are pioneering a new model of university education centered on the concept of students for life. At the same time, we are also redesigning our curriculum to incorporate interdisciplinarity in our education model. We started our journey in 2018, and as such, we are still very much a piece of work in progress. But we believe that our relationship with our students does not end with the completion of an undergraduate degree. In fact, the undergraduate experience is only the beginning. Continuing education and training, or CET for short, is an integral part of each student's education and personal development. And it is a means to ensure that they remain competitive. We are partners with our students and alumni in their learning journeys for life. Today, we have a very distinguished panel of speakers who will share their thoughts with us on transforming higher education and serving future learning societies. I look forward to learning from our speakers and to exchanging ideas with our panelists and participants this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna. You gave a lot of points uh, as food for thought, uh, and, and, and I hope we can unpack them during the panel discussion. So now I would like to welcome Asun Supra, Chief, Se Chief Sector Officer in EDB's Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. 
Sinsip has led ADP's largest portfolio in education operations in South Asia, is actively involved in global initiatives such as the International Financing Facility for Education. In his present role, he leads ADP's cross-sectoral issues on education, health, water, transport, energy, and urban sectors. He has introduced new financing modalities in education, and I'd like to turn it over to him uh, to share his perspectives for future directions in education. Santi, uh, thanks for your kind introduction. Uh, before starting, I would like to give my heart, heart uh, thanks to the uh, eminent speakers on this panel, uh, Vice Provost Susanna Leon, the NUS, President Otto from Leiden University, Vice President, President Suchia from the KO University, Professor Kong from Education University of Hong Kong, President Bia, from Mapua University, and Vice Chancellor Lotful Hassan from Bangladesh Agricultural University. It is our privilege to host you in this panel discussion. And we are so grateful to you for making your busy time, uh, busy time for this forum. Cooperation in higher education is great importance to Asia and the Pacific, including international internationalization of students and faculty mobility as countries seek to put their education system on the global platform. In the coming years, some of the largest cohort of the tertiary students will be from Asia. We hope that a regional ecosystem for higher education will be built up in, in the Asia Pacific. At ADB, uh, as the, uh, the vice provost uh, Sujan Ryong mentioned, recently produced an edited volume, Powering learning society during an age of disruption in collaboration with many global experts, including Mr. Eric here from the National University of Singapore. In this book, we highlight that more than ever before, education is everyone's responsibility. In my role as a chief sector officer at ADB, I believe that we also need to consider interdisciplinary nature of education uh, here, I'd like to share four points that which I think very much critical for education to address these current times. The first, as the DG uh, Bruno Krausko mentioned, climate change. Addressing climate change and making a paradigm shift in education for strong climate action. Education can be a great enabler and also a tool to help realize climate ambition. Second, as the uh, vice provost, provost the Sujana Leung mentioned, facilitating the new normal after pandemic, particularly in coping with any learning losses. That's extremely important. Third, accelerating digital transformation in, in an equitable and inclusive way for improving quality of learning. We also need to ensure technology help many and not just a few in this context. Lastly, the Providing solution for demographic transition. Currently, Asia and the Pacific has the largest generation of the young people globally in history of about 1.8 million, half of them in Asia Pacific. But UN agency has projected it. All the people in Asia and the Pacific will triple, reaching 1.3 billion by 2050, making it a reason that high proportion of the old people in the world. Universities are increasingly providing well-rounded professional career services to the student. A recently launched the Career Plus app at the National University of Singapore uses artificial intelligence and big data to help students plan their education and career. By keeping track of the skills acquired and the skills employees are looking for, career coaching and counseling have become ever more important to help young people align with their capacity and interest to the demands of the market price. Entrepreneurship and startup ecosystems with incubators and accelerator will become increasingly the norm rather than exception in the university. I am really looking forward to hearing the view of the, this eminent panel and to continuing our conversation. They are well placed to speak our issues related to the sustainability studies and about digital transformation. Teacher education that helps build the capacity of present 
and future educator. Education for higher, high technology in agriculture and also new and transformational approach to global accredited engineering program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sung Soo. Uh, it is good that you outlined many points uh, in which ADB is interested in and in the context of uh, the transforming nature of higher education. Thank you for that. Uh, now it's my pleasure to turn to Professor Anate Otto, President of the Executive Board of Leiden University in the Netherlands. Anate leads strategy, knowledge transfer, alliances, and international relations. Uh, but also inclusion and sustainability, among many other things, uh, at the Leiden University. Uh, she has an illustrious background in law. Uh, today, we look forward to hearing her speak on the role of higher education institutions in promoting sustainability, which is a very timely and uh, highly uh, debated topic, given the great momentum provided by COP26. Over to you, Professor Anity Otto. Thank you very much, uh, Shanti. It's a pleasure being here. And thank you very much, of course, from, for the invitation uh, to speak today. For us, it's in the morning, but uh, good afternoon, everybody, all listeners. I'm very honored to, to do this. And uh, it's really timely, as you said, because there's many things going on. And I would like to share some ideas, but also to learn from you to see how we can collaborate and um, keep up the challenges and find solutions. Um, so I'm very willing to accept your invitation, Bruno, to collaborate more and fight the climate change through our knowledge as an institution. Um, before coming to the specific topic, I would like to just mention why I'm here and why that university is really into this topic, also from our background as an international research-driven uh, broad university. So I just would like to mention a few key figures and to show why uh, that university thinks that it can contribute to all the challenges you mentioned. Um, yes, we are the oldest university in the Netherlands and we, behind me you can see uh, some of the nice pictures where we are working. But um, yes, we have seven faculties, so we have all the broad disciplines together. And I think that's one of the key issues that the interdisciplinary research and collaboration is key in uh, the issues we talk of today. And I'll come back to that later. We also have a Leiden Bioscience Park, which is on the other side of, of the canal. And um, to, to mention that it was there where the origin of the Janssen Janssen, Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccine was originated and we collaborated as of today together with the, um, the company to make sure that we can provide uh, the vaccine throughout the world. For us, international collaboration is at the DNA of Leiden. As from the start in 1575, we already had international scholars at our university. And from the beginning, we also started making collaborations throughout the world. Um, at the moment, we work together with 60 universities in Asia, among others, um, the colleagues here at the table of the panel, uh, the National University of Singapore and Keio University. So for us, the the um, collaboration with uh, Asia is of the key of our strategic plan, which we launched this year, and is building on and strengthening the relationships we have so far. So we also have an institute in Indonesia, in Jakarta, where we work really together with nice colleagues uh, there, but also in Egypt and Morocco, to give you a few examples. As mentioned, in our strategic plan, there also the challenges, the societal challenges are really in the core of our program for the coming years. So we see as, as an institute, as an agent to change, to see how we can provide our knowledge and education to the future generations to make sure that we can contribute and fight the climate change. So we fully agree with uh, a ADB that institutions as universities are critical to strengthen the role of collaboration, but providing solutions and also the current challenges as mentioned before. So also health and education, I think have to go hand in hand. So coming back to the key issues of today, where can we provide as a university solutions or helping the climate change? We were ranked the seventh in the uh, international ranking, the green metric, which was a, a, an overview of all the global sustainability rankings of universities. And there it's explained how universities 
collaborate to the challenges. And for us, the few things are mentioned there where water management and waste on the Bioscience Park, for example, where I can show you many other examples, where through the organization and institution itself, setting the example, how we think you can change on behavior. But moreover, of course, it's all about the heart of education and research. For us, the relationship between research and education is key. So we really engage students to collaborate also on innovation and knowledge transfer and bring that into the education programs. And one of the key things there is what we call a green office, where the students themselves organize themselves in a green office and work together with our researchers on topics which are really at the heart of their mind and that they really feel that they contribute at a personal level to the problems of today. This is all also laid down in our sustainability vision, you can read, uh, where we bring forward how we want to do that the coming years. And one of the key elements is there, that sustainability has to be part of most every educational program which we offer at Leiden University. Um, an example of that, for example, on the interdisciplinarity, where we really bring the disciplines together. And on top of that, we focus on sustainability. For example, on Master of Governance in Sustainability, but also on the bioscience part, where we really bring in behavioral sciences into the technical uh, knowledge, where we think that technical solution as such are just not enough. You need to know the ecosystem, you need to know how behavior works, and how you can launch Positive solutions to uh, society. So that's, I think, on the core mission uh, where we think that interdisciplinarity, but also the linkage between education and research is in the heart of our strategy. An example of that is what we call the Livermore Planet Program, where we have brought together scholars from all over the faculties to work together on what we call sustainability, but we named it, framed it as Livermore Planet. And there also keys our partnerships with outside institutions, NGOs, but also local governments, uh, national uh, institutions to make sure that we really work together. There's a true collaboration on all the knowledge coming together. And for example, we do also that abroad. In Indonesia, we work with our Institute of Environmental Sciences, which is actually based at the Bioscience Park in Leiden. We work together with our Indonesian uh, institute in Jakarta and from there it's a hub to work together with all institutions we have great relationship with and for example at the moment there is a PhD um, exchange on biodiversity conservation for example where PhDs from Indonesia can come to Leiden but also we work together with our academic hospital um, biology scientists uh, on tuberculosis and diabetes research actually on a plant at the university in uh, Jakarta. So we really would like to provide also infrastructure facilities and elaborate to see how we can bring that knowledge together with the expertise at a local level to work together. So knowledge transfer actually is really key and it's not in one direction, it's a collaboration both ways, where we make sure that we also use the knowledge and expertise from uh, the universities and experts uh, at place. So bringing also together to conclude, because there's so much more to tell about, but um, I have my time limits here. I think through real cooperation, which we also do through European universities in Europe, I think we really do that also in Asia. And we really look forward to even intensifying that for the coming years and to see how we can really fight the climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anati. Uh, really very interesting, very interesting initiatives. Uh, the interdisciplinarity is, is uh, now emerging as a very common common topic that all of all the speakers have mentioned so far. Thank you. Um, now we're delighted to welcome Professor Motohiro Tsuchiya, Vice President for Global Engagement in Information Technology at Keio University. Professor Motohiro Tsuchiya is the Vice President uh, um, at, uh, for global engagement, but he's also a member of the Space Security Division of the Committee on National S uh, Space Policy at the Cabinet Office. Uh, so he has a strong interest uh, in, uh, in the area of cybersecurity. I turn it over to you, Professor Suchia, to share your thoughts 
on digital education, global partnerships in an increasingly digitalized world. Over to you. Thank you very much, Shanti. So um, um, good afternoon from Tokyo, Japan. So it's great to um, meet online um, um, President Otto. So uh, as she says, so Leiden uh, University and Keio University has a good relationship to exchange students. But very unfortunately, due to the Japanese government's tighter border control, we have not exchanged students last two years. Very unfortunate. But so we want to um, restart it quite soon because the Japanese government changed the policy. So we try to open the border now. So we will have a, a better collaboration quite soon. Um, so I want to share some slides. Um, 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 I will talk about global engagement and the partnership for the digital world, uh, what we are thinking. So um, these are um, 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 universities and um, um, some uh, university networks I have engaged uh, for the past nine months. So last May, I became the vice president of Keio University. So even during the pandemic, we are making some collaboration online, but I'm so much frustrated. So we want to do something more beyond uh, the online engagement. So, um, but what, what we are thinking is um, um, the past. So KU University was established in 1858. And so our founder is Yukichi Fukuzawa. So he's printed on the Japanese banknotes. Uh, it's a 10,000 yen bill. So it's almost a US $100 bill. So after the pandemic, please come to Japan and find uh, this banknote for your souvenir. So because it will be reprint, um, have a new design in 2024, actually. So you have just two years to get um, uh, this banknote. But so after the um, establishment, 10 years after the, our establishment, Japan had the largest civil war in 1868. Uh, it was called the Boshin War. And so, but at, during that time, so students, so if you look at the picture on the right side, so students are looking far away to, so they were curious what's going on in the war. But our founder, Yukichi Fukuzawa, didn't stop his class, uh, even a civil war. So he said, no matter what the world changes, the academic life in our country never stops as long as KO exists. So we try to continue our education in a crisis. Now, so KO uh, expanded more. So we have 10 graduates, um, the 14 graduate schools, six major and six minor campuses, and we have nine affiliated schools. What does it mean? So we have elementary schools, junior high schools, high schools under the uh, Keio University system. So we are trying to rewire these networks, these campuses, these schools. This is an important agenda now. So uh, during the pandemic, we thought that we have to do something new to make uh, our community stronger. The one idea is Keio single ID. As we have um, a two elementary schools, the youngest student is uh, five years old. So they are coming to KO, KO University sometime later. And so some students joining KO system uh, undergraduate faculties like me. So I was just as, um, came from the other high school. And we will ha have the alumni association after they graduated. So we are famous for the very strong alumni association. So we are trying to connect these people and so we want to have something new um, um, because we have a medical school and a hospital. So our uh, engagement goes 100 years. So it's really lifelong learning. So we want to have our uh, system longer and, um, um, and we want to uh, um, offer better services, better learning opportunities after the pandemics. So our president, uh, Kohei Ito, is saying that, so teachers are like music performance performers. So we can deliver music online. We can use Zoom and the WebEx and other things. Live streaming music is available. We can enjoy it. But on-site music is something different. 
So performers are creating music when they are feeling audiences response. So education is something like that. So basics of KOA is um, dedicate ourselves to education through live lectures. So we want to go back. Of course, we will use other technologies, online technologies, information te technologies. We have to combine, we have to mix those technologies, but our core is uh, resonance uh, um, um, among us. So he was thinking about classical music, but my favorite music is something like this, rock and roll. But in any formats, so we need resonance between students and the faculties as much as possible. So we want to do it. We want to um, re-innovate ourselves and we want to expand our, our resonance between Keio University and you. I want to expand our uh, collaboration uh, with you. So our young bloods, our students are waiting for moving and touching moments in classrooms. It is very challenging for all of us now, but let's continue our classes, education and communication. So I didn't go into the details of the information technology or online education, but this is what we are thinking these days. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suchia. While speaking about the digital advances, you also point to the centrality of the connect with, between students and, and the teachers and the, and the lecturers. So thank you for uh, not letting us forget that uh, um, in, in, you know, in moving towards the digitalized world. Um, I'd now like to turn to Professor Kong Xiu uh, Chung. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure and privilege to invite you today. Professor Kong is the director of the Center of Learning, Teaching and Technology at the Education University of Hong Kong. Uh, the Education University of Hong Kong plays a pivotal role in preparing educators for the future and has a strong imprint both in, in the region as well as globally. Professor Kong has an extensive background in pedagogy in the digital classroom, online learning and teacher professional development and computational thinking education. Welcome, Professor Kong. And we invite you to share your thoughts and for, on preparing educators for future learning environments. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you, ADP, for inviting me to share with you. So uh, let me share my PowerPoint with you and uh, on uh, the topic that uh, we have set uh, for this panel. So I'm going to uh, talk a bit uh, in these five minutes about the new horizons for teaching, learning, and technology for youth. So uh, why we have the changing landscape because of the old uh, the technology, the digitalization is uh, uh, coming to no walks of life. So uh, no matter AI, augmented reality, VR, 3D printing, all coming in. So what is the position of the University of Education? So we are positioning us as the education plus. And we want to eat educational innovation and we want to enable students to be professionally to learn across disciplines and we have to set up a multidisciplinary uh, environment. So when you see this program uh, recently in, this, uh, uh, in, in the past one or two years, we set up the bachelor's us is about heritage, education, and arts management, early childhood and family studies, uh, English studies, and digital com um, communication. For the Bachelor of Science, we have the integrated environmental management, sports science and coaching, executive, executive management, AI and ag tech, uh, sociology and community uh, studies, and so on. For whole square, we also have the real master program on AI and ag tech, and the master of arts in show arts, education and creative practice, global studies in education, global histories of education, and so on and so forth. So uh, we try to uh, enable uh, uh, students to learn in a um, more than one disciplines. And another thing that we have currently promoting is about the AI literacy program for all university students, not from engineering, not from only mathematics, but from Chinese, um, as I call, all walks of, uh, all kinds of program. So we have the, uh, a, a, a step for uh, students to go through, through uh, to begin with understanding machine learning, and then they have another course, understanding deep learning, and then they have to do a project to consider when they produce AI uh, 
project outcomes they have to consider, the ethical uh, barriers. So we also have a general education for all students and they need to go through a course called university portfolio. That is, they have to re make reflection on what they have gained through the university life. So it is for all students. And they have to choose one of the uh, topics we know, uh, like STEM and then uh, educators in the 21st century and so on and so forth. So all these are the options, but by the end, they have to take uh, anyone to become a more multidisciplinary and they are graduate from the university. And um, around uh, eight years ago, we started with e-portfolio. So every student, when they join the education university, they have to make reflection on what they gain uh, through uh, the university education. So when we look into the uh, outcome for all these reflections, we focus on the problem-solving skills, critical thinking skills, creative thinking, oral communication skills, uh, so on and so forth. So, these are the learning outcomes that we expect every student when they graduate. You can see they really gain and increase in terms of this self um, um, reflection on their achievement uh, in educational uh, during their study in UAK. So uh, we also have the interdisciplinary research in um, the R and D center for uh, multidisciplinary uh, research, and we have research group brought people together to, be, to, to conduct interdisciplinary research. In addition, the mission of the university uh, towards digitalization is uh, PNI. So PNI is professional excellence, ethical responsibility, and mo most importantly, innovation. So uh, for our approach towards digitalization are in three dimensions. One is a university-wide e-learning uh, strategy, but we add digital competency. That is, everyone, when they join AUHK, is not about just using the tools for e-learning, but they have to produce um, a learning outcome by creative works through digital competency. So you can see there is a diagram here because we have, we have a workshop very soon on using the analytics uh, in Moodle because Moodle is the RMS for all teachers and students in the university. We have launched um, a lot of uh, 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 plug in in the Moodle platform, make sure they, uh, our academic teaching staff can write on the data to make pedagogical decision making. So we have a requirement for all university students when they graduate, they have to fulfill the IT competency in education requirement. Or, uh, originally, uh, it is only one path, that is IT e-portfolio checking. Now, we get the step. Step is for online learning and teaching because Many of our students become teachers and they need to know how to do online teaching as well, besides face-to-face uh, -face teaching. And recently, we add another part, that is the AI literacy part. That is, they can make a choice among these three parts to be IP in education competent. We uh, support the school system in Hong Kong in terms of the digitalization for uh, a lot of STEM activities. And our STEM is to be make response to the fourth industrialization. We want students to be really uh, competent in uh, all walks of life in digitalization. So for the STEM, I see activities to have uh, human capital building. And that is why we need a pedagogical design and need our students, the younger generation in K-12 to be digital uh, creative. So we, when we roll out the STEM CT, uh, we focus on the IoT because everything will be connected concept with sensing, reasoning, reacting, and we want to have the ability to uh, conduct uh, STEM activities to uh, acquire causal reasoning, ability, se sequencing, conditional reasoning, engineering, system thinking, and so on. So they become, uh, know how to express themselves, connect with each other, and questioning and power in the STEM activities. So these are the, for the junior activities. We have integrated both the STEM activities with AI and with programming together. So we could not roll out one by one. We want to make students really live in the age of digitalization that IoT, AI, coding are all come together and they have to learn uh, all this together. So uh, we have a lot of activities rolling out, even though now uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, it's not time in the school now, and we go on these activities online. And, um, Recently, we also conduct a lot of um, uh, computational thinking, education activities, and uh, we are very ambitious by 2024. We want to have 90,000 students to be involved 
uh, 168 schools, that is around 200 schools in Hong Kong, that's nearly half of the schools in Hong Kong will have computational thinking education formally in the curriculum as well as the teachers are being empowered. And all these activities are being recognized by SDE and IHDE recognized this is a very uh, profound thing, a city uh, education program. So we support our students, not just in terms of coding, but we want to integrate coding into subject learning with Chinese language, English language, and mathematics. So this is a program to be rolled out uh, by the end of this year uh, on animation, coding, cognitive tools, and pedagogies for subject learning in self-regulated learning and computational thinking development. For secondary school, higher, uh, higher se senior secondary school students also wrote the uh, AI literacy program uh, for all uh, secondary students in Hong Kong who are interested in um, uh, using AI to develop application. And we hope that we, they learn through all these machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence application, they really can make use of some high platform programming knowledge to uh, integrate uh, the knowledge into building some new line AI application. So we are expecting to involve 3,000 3, students uh, in the coming uh, three years. So in terms of global engagement, we uh, want our students to be really engaged in terms of the curriculum in a few experience. So in terms of curriculum level, we have some joint project with, say, uh, the South China Normal University or the Beijing Normal University. But when they graduate, uh, after four years, they do not have only the degree, but also a master degree. So this is a new initiative that we want uh, lifelong learning to be integrated in the curriculum and then we design the curriculum. And for few experience, we encourage our students to go out to other countries like Japan, USA, Finland, to have few experience exchange. That means when they teach, they experience it not just in Hong Kong, but whenever possible, we'll send them out to other countries to teach in other countries, make sure they have the global engagement. So uh, we also engage all academics and teaching staff in NHK to be scholarly. So we have the uh, 23 top 2% uh, most cyber scientists by the Stanford University. That means NHK are having uh, a lot of academics who are media really top tier in the universe uh, in, around the world. So, um, and uh, we also got innovation award in terms of a 29 uh, innovation award because of the uh, advancement in pedagogical design, as well as the uh, other innovation, uh, intellectual invention, innovation competition. So that's um, the major point I want to share with you. So uh, during the panel discussion, we can uh, 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 share more on uh, what uh, I have uh, talked about. Thank you, uh, Santi, for the Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a uh, that was many uh, interesting things that you shared. Uh, um, you know, in, in terms of like the intersection of digital uh, STEM, uh, like the STEM C, I heard this for the first time. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, which is now my pleasure to welcome two discussants from Bangladesh and from the Philippines. Both are leaders in their domain, implementing very interesting and forward-looking initiatives. Um, let me first invite Professor Lutful Hassan, Vice Chancellor of Bangladesh Agricultural University. Professor Hassan has an extensive background in the Faculty of Agriculture, leading work in genetics and plant breeding. He's been in many global universities and has led several research pro projects in plant breeding and biotechnology um, of the crops and has several publications to his uh, credit. Over to you, Hassan Saab, and we look forward to hearing your perspectives and thoughts on education, training, and research for high-tech agriculture. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Santi. I'm really highly delighted and pleased to be with you in this session, in this webinar, particularly on gender and education of science. Uh, your voice is a little uh, not so audible. Can you hear me now? Yes, better now. So, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks to the ADB and the National University of Singapore for organizing such a good day. And thank you for the webinar because transforming higher education in certain future societies. So, as far as we are concerned, really, uh, we start with. Uh, so, you know, so we have already explained some of important things over here, particularly the college partnership innovation. And one most important thing is that at increasing unprecedented, uh, uh, 
predictability in everyone. Particularly, I would like to tell you that this, due to this COVID and climate change issues, this unpredictability is going at a rise. In Bangladesh also, we saw that there are some unpredictable events are going on, particularly in, in relation with the climate change. Bangladesh is situated or located in such an area where the, uh, due to climate change, salinity, submergence, uh, and then uh, uh, all kinds of cold tolerance, heat, heat problems, all these are there. And some of, sometimes we saw that drought is also there. So with all these climatic change issues, we are suffering from, we, you can't hear, hear me, is it okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So all these issues are very much important for us. And that is why this climate change and COVID situation has deteriorated the situation of Bangladesh here. And we at Bangladesh Agricultural University, we are working on these issues very seriously, particularly to develop the crops, livestock fisheries, mechanization, value addition and value chain, food technology, food, uh, safe food, all these issues we are addressing now at this moment. But then our ideas always match it, always matches with you. Number one is we are going for a digital classroom. Digital classroom is very much important during this COVID situation. Our university did it perfectly, and most of the universities in Bangladesh they have undertaken this digital classroom technology and uh, distant learning also for the students, those who cannot come in the campus due to this COVID situation. Now the situation is we are doing it blended uh, in the blended form. Still we are doing and we have multidisciplinary approaches also. Personally, I am very much in favor of multidisciplinary approaches, which is now really required for the globe, not only Bangladesh for the globe, if we want to want to improve our agricultural sector, if we want to improve our education sector, if we want to improve our knowledge, I mean knowledge dissemination, then we need these multidisciplinary approaches. And these are very, very much important. And through these multidisciplinary approaches, we can also improve the standard of understanding of students and teachers together so that they can learn, uh, they can learn very free, very freely, and they can gain the knowledge from their tutor and they can disseminate it throughout uh, everywhere. Particularly another thing is that multiple stakeholder is involved here in Bangladesh, particularly in terms of research, if you want to say agricultural research, medical research, engineering research, or any other social, uh, social uh, aspects research, everywhere we need this multiple stakeholder involvement. Particularly in our country, a good number of people that is then uh, their number is more than 50% those who are farmers getting. So our university, the knowledge sharing and knowledge development, always we share with the, with the, with the farmers. Now, it's now improving. Farmers are getting uh, digital connections. Everywhere we have started this digital communication, particularly this is the success of this government, that the government is uh, really trying very hard to, um, to bring everybody in uh, digital communication or digital connection. So there is, there is a very big change now is going on in Bangladesh. Particularly, we are working with ADB, Asian Development Bank, and we are uh, trying to submit our PPP for the for our work in, in the future, future days, particularly, hopefully, in the, in the next, next year, we will start it, where we want to make Bangladesh Agricultural University as a regional hub of agricultural research, so that we can extend our research and academics to the to the uh, to the Asia Pacific areas under the uh, uh, under the leadership of Bangladesh Agricultural University and other universities also. And we are working together with uh, Dr. Sansupra, You know, uh, maybe you know already. And our program is going on. And uh, I visited personally the Seoul National University, and I, I'm highly impressed to see their facilities which is really very much important for us. And again, our team visited this uh, Seoul National University and uh, they got the training. So the education and training, these things are goes, going together. We need to earn knowledge through our education and through our training programs and which we need the faculty members and the students. Everybody should be trained in the same manner. That is why 
our attempt is to work together. We want to work with all the universities, particularly I'm very much pleased to see the university professors are here, university vice chancellors and uh, uh, different important people are here with the webinar. We want to make a collaboration with you also. Particularly, I, we have uh, several collaboration with uh, uh, various countries. I saw, uh, we are, uh, so we, 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 can, we, we can go through our research, our activities with all of you. And uh, particularly our mission with ADB will hopefully be successful and uh, there will be a big change here in Bangladesh. We're looking forward to that so that we, we can partner in all of you in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, thank you for sharing all the new departures you are making in terms of uh, enabling the agricultural sector to play a much higher role uh, in the economy and, and society. Thank you. I'd like to now turn uh, to, uh, to uh, Dr. Reynaldo Pia, President and CEO of Mapua University. It's our privilege to welcome you. Uh, Dr. Bia is Chairman of the Engineering Sciences and Technology Division of the National Academy of Science and Technolo Technology of the Philippines. He has he also holds uh, and has uh, in the past held several illustrious positions. He has pioneered ABET accreditation of engineering and IT academic programs in the Philippines and, and has initiated many innovations in the university that I was reading about. Uh, I think Mapua University has been a prime mover in many new departures in, in the way universities can operate. Um, very warm welcome, Professor Bia, and over to you for sharing your experiences. Okay, thank you, Shanti. And thank you to ADB and the NUS for this opportunity to participate in this webinar. First, I'd like to say that our university is a seven, 97 year old school and the first 75 years were devoted mainly to uh, bringing up the quality of instruction. So it became one of the best performers in the national licensure exams in the field of engineering. The school was formerly called the Mapua Institute of Technology. In 2017, it became a university. At the turn of the 21st century, it was acquired by the Yuchenko Group of Companies, and we work in addressing the issues of uh, or the challenges of a global and digital world. But first, uh, let me deal with uh, a learning society. Uh, in fact, I think it's a new, new framework for us, but it's something we've been doing uh, in the past years. For example, we, uh, we have an open learning initiative and we also have service learning. So in open learning, we share our uh, online modules with the Commission on Higher Education or the CHED, which has a portal called CHED Connect. So it's an open, it's OER, so any school can actually access these modules, uh, which come from various schools. We also have an initiative called STEM Teach. This is a free online, uh, these are free online courses that are made available to high school teachers throughout the Philippines. So we made our first run just before the pandemic and we had 1000 public and private school teachers, high school teachers who joined this asynchronous mode of online delivery. And we just started our second run and we have more than a thousand uh, learners. So we hope to expand this in the years to come and in fact, make it available even to non-teachers in a channel or something or on a website of our school. We also uh, you know, do service learning. And by that, we mean uh, our students uh, try to attain the educational outcomes of their course by going out to the communities and actually learning with the community in solving their problems. So at the Malayan Colleges Laguna, one of our subsidiaries, we are partners with a local government unit in protecting a particular river and studying the river along with the community. So I think that should be an example of, you know, our school learning along with the community. These are, and uh, we have other examples of service learning 
in the Bicol area in one of our schools there, the University of Nueva Cáceres, which is part of our group. Uh, we do collaborative research with 16 local government units. And our school in Davao, South Philippines, Malayan Colleges, Mindanao, we are now helping two agricultural growers recover from the pandemic. So uh, I guess those are mainly our strategies in uh, you know, bringing learning to people outside of our own school, to the community outside. But actually we have uh, other engagements along that line, which are part of our school activities. Like we are now negotiating with a global online learning platform so that our alumni can access their courses as part of the, their development or lifelong learning pursuits. Uh, we make it part to our continuing education and special competencies program. So, uh, well, along the lines of global and uh, digital challenges, we had, uh, uh, we had ourselves uh, subjected voluntarily to ABET accreditation as mentioned by Shanti, because we thought that to be a credible player in the global arena, we had to have some institutional credential. And so we were the first school to subject ourselves, not with some, not without trepidation, because we knew that it was going to be a difficult process, but we did get ABET accreditation. ABET being the sole accreditor of engineering and technology programs in the United States. So, uh, and having done that, we proceeded to, to expand our global activities and, uh, well, uh, forgive the self-indulgence, but at the moment we are already ranked under QS, both in the Asian University ranking and in the star ranking. And under Times Higher Education, we have an impact ranking. An impact ranking, I'd like to highlight that because that is based on our initiatives for sustainability. And uh, three years ago, I think we tried, we were ranked in three of the UN SDGs so we did not get an overall rank. But last year we had uh, five SDGs that were ranked and this year we had six SDGs that were ranked. So now we are mentioned in the THE impact ranking. So that is our little contribution to promoting uh, sustainable development in the, in the world. So, uh, so we have uh, international partners in research, the KTH Royal in Sweden and a host of schools in Taiwan, our neighbor. And the one in uh, Sweden involves the use of indigenous materials for high-tech applications. And the other for Taiwan, we have a lot of uh, studies in membrane technology and in pollution control. Now uh, on the digital front, uh, we, uh, we tried to grow with the uh, development of the technology so that we started just browsing websites, curating them, and uh, giving the sites to our students and to our faculty until it came to a point that we, we outgrew it. And uh, we finally subscribed to a commercial grade learning management system in 2017. And prior to the pandemic, we deployed it in a variety of ways. We had digital days. You see in Manila in the Philippines, there are a lot of class suspending days. For example, typhoon, flooding, political rallies, ASEAN summit, and uh, uh, religious processions. So we have to stop school, no classes during those days. So we thought that, uh, you know, maybe uh, we could do better than that. So when we had our lear learning management system, whenever such occurrences were impending, we just declared we have, we'll have digital day, everybody stay at home. And we actually at the start did synchronous learning, but now we're doing asynchronous. And before the pandemic, the Al volcano erupted and we had, instead of a digital day, we had digital week. And uh, so we were quite prepared when the pandemic came for a two year, you know, well now a two year digital engagement, purely digital engagement between faculty and our students. And we also had an activity called Digital Rush. Students can opt to take a digital online section in lieu of a face-to-face -face during rush hour. And that was very well subscribe. So uh, we're bullish on digital technology 
but our preference actually is blended or hybrid where we take the both the best of both worlds face to face and uh, and online and we are we are subscribed to the biggest databases for our students and our faculty we are subs we have subscribed to global online learning platforms so we're using two global online platforms to strengthen or to enhance our curriculum we actually integrate these micro credentials into our courses. And uh, the student has to pass the assessment before he can be given credit for the Mapua, Mapua course. So, uh, so we're trying to, uh, you know, to build the quality along that line. We know the deficiencies or the shortcomings maybe of, uh, of that kind of delivery, but we're trying to, to remedy that in uh, various ways and making learning for our students enriched. So uh, our premise all the while has been that the sum of knowledge of the world is expanding. That's why we went into research and that the world is shrinking very fast because of digital computer technologies. And that's why we have gone into a lot of effort to get to have digital competency in all our activities, both academic and administrative. So uh, that's what we are. That's what <laughs> Thank, you, Thank very much. you. Thank you. So interesting. Uh, digital days, uh, digital rush. Oh, so interesting that you combine so many different new ways of making the university uh, gear to the future. Many thanks, uh, Professor Pia. Uh, we'd like to now open the like a little bit more interactive discussion. Um, but before that, I would like to encourage the, uh, the audience, the participants to put in your questions in the q and I see that there already, there's already one question and some comments. So please do put in your questions uh, to the panelists or to, or more generally uh, on the topic, or if you also like to share any observations, please do that. Uh, but I'd like to now go back to Professor um, Aniti Otto. You know, like actually all of you talked about interdisciplinary disciplinary and multidisciplinary education and literally all of all the panelists touched on this today uh so uh honestly like can you share a little bit about how you know can this be practiced in you know what's the best way of doing it like you have different departments and faculties uh, and you have certain credits certain courses and specializations that students opt for so how do you make this happen in practice and how do you also then assess and certify students in, you know, if, if this whole uh, multidisciplinary study stream is to move ahead? Thank you, Shanti, because this is a really nice question. And I would like to illustrate it along an example where I can bring all the elements together. I think key is to uh, initiate and stimulate as a board of university programs where people really, yeah, um, stimulated to come together. So what we did with the interdisciplinary pro programs, we launched nine of them a few years ago, and one of them is the Little Planets program, as I mentioned. So we provided quite an, um, an amount of money to make sure that we can make appointments of professors across the disciplines. So we attracted new people, but also appointed uh, chairs in the different uh, disciplines, and they bring them together in this Little Planet program. So you'll find professors on uh, CO3 uh, emissions, on governance, on uh, biodiversity. So a mixture of, of disciplines and they all come together in this program. And um, not only they do research together and have their joint PhDs, but also they involve students in the program. And one beautiful example of how we, we do that is that uh, we together with the local communities and farmers and um, what we call uh, water management um, government institutions across the Netherlands, we came together and there is a, uh, in the landscape around Leiden, a huge problem on biodiversity, but also that the water level, level is increasing. So on actually on the actual fields, uh, students and those researchers uh, are actually at the moment working with farmers and uh, biologists to uh, investigate what the solutions could be for this immense issue at the moment in the Netherlands of the water level coming up and the land level is uh, decreasing. So uh, actually by the actual problem in front of you, which is really 
seeable, like the examples of Bangladesh I just heard, uh, students are really coming to the land together with the expertise, their professors, and also the, the stakeholders uh, involved to see how in the coming years, a 10 year program, which is financed by the local communities, the university and national research institutions, to see how we really can contribute, not only at a local level, but also use this knowledge throughout the Netherlands and throughout the world. So I think this is from local to global, an example where at an interdisciplinary research through our Little Planet program, the students are involved from the different disciplines and they apply that in their education program. They actually feel what's really going on, but they can give a positive contribution to help to solve the problem. Because that's also maybe something to mention that we feel that the students, the future generation, really are faced with those enormous problems that they've in their daily life they uh, are encountered with those issues. So by involving them actually in the solution uh, development, they can really yeah, make sure that also their future is... Uh, There's also another uh, question that, uh, that's been asked of you, which is like, what's the most uh, best, what's the best way to integrate sustainability development into programs and curriculum at a university? So uh, is there a... Well, I think by, by simulating actually by a, a, a real program, not only in words or strategic plans, but also providing funds also to teachers so that they have some assistance to see how they can, through our green office, for example, contribute to the actual education programs. So that's more on a micro level. On a macro level, it's also by making sure that we launch new programs, especially on the interdisciplinary level. For example, we will launch two new bachelors on interdisciplinary sustainability programs. For example, also in, uh, artificial intelligence, but also on biosciences. So you will see that it's by different elements, different instruments together, you have to fit in the whole model. It's just not one size fits all solution. Uh, but I think there's really need for leaders of universities to stimulate the actual programs and making sure that funds are available to come to uh, yeah, to really results. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aniti. Uh, Professor Hassan, I wonder if you'd like to weigh in, like, you know, Professor uh, Otto mentioned water management uh, and how communities came also together. So, uh, uh, you know, in terms of making agriculture bring the um, an, an allied uh, you know allied activities around agriculture to bring bring societal returns um, is your university uh, thinking of doing something in that direction yes uh, this is a, this is a very good idea that uh, which has been ventilated already our university is working very seriously in this irrigation and water management section and particularly they are working after the liberation in 1971 our, and our university has a very good department under the Faculty of Engineering and uh, Food Technology. So these people are working very hard and at the remote areas where the farmers are working together. So we have a very good collaboration with the farmers. These there are multiple stakeholders are working there and the government uh, uh, ministries are working there. ADB is also working there. I'm very much delighted to tell you that Asian Development Bank, they have very good program in different areas of Bangladesh where poor farmers are benefited, where the poor farmers are benefited from that. So these are all important and goes together and our, uh, our research and the academics, which is very much related to develop these uh, poor people in the, rural, in the rural Bangladesh. And we have very good systematic drainage and irrigation water management system here in Bangladesh under the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water Development, and then uh, universities and then research institutes. We are working together to uplift the livelihood of the farmers. So this is my comment on this. On, Thank on you. This. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so you you are leading uh, the sort of the work of ADB in uh, policy and strategy in many of course, yes. So yes, yes, in our national planning, uh, you know this. Uh, Coming from this is the eight five year plan is now going on where ADB is uh, ADB is involved over there. ADB activities has already already been uh, I mean in, in Bangladesh ADB activities is going on and in the in this planning they have all, already integrated all these ideas and uh, multiple stakeholders over right. there. 
So we are going in a very nice way, in a very nice manner under the leadership of this government. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I wonder if I can turn to Sang Supra. Uh, would you like to share something about how do you see uh, the future of this type of, you know, realizing the objectives of strategy 2030 this, in this multidisciplinary way of uh, education? Uh, thanks, uh, Santi, for asking me. Uh, while we have it here, eminent uh, panelists, they perhaps they are in the front line on this one. My observation uh, here that we'd like to share is that we have to now move away from education for education. You know, the often uh, traditional university uh, very much uh, focus certain field and the silo approach. But here, all the leader talk about importance of the multi Disciplinary, disciplinary work and open platform. That's, I think, very important. I give the example of the what ADB tried to do in a few areas. Uh, <clears throat> in the higher education particularly, uh, to address the, uh, say, food insecurity issue. I was, our point is how we can really address that issue. There's many different ways to address the food insecurity. You know, we can perhaps intervene uh, through the education, uh, uh, the agriculture project, we can train farmers. That's a traditional approach. Uh, but another approach will be we can groom, we can educate the uh, uh, set of the uh, engineers or policymaker through the higher education institution. And they can be the one who really change uh, the, you know, address this issue. And then also in the in in the uh, agriculture sector, as the uh, while ago that uh, Vice Chancellor Hassan and also many of you mentioned that climate change has a huge impact on the in the, the, the agriculture productivity. We have to really overcome that challenge. So we try to now the uh, now go to this issue. Uh, develop the program, uh, get the, some partners working together. This is how we are working with the Bangladesh Education uh, Agriculture University. Another one we try to do is that the, now, the digital area. Digital as the, um, uh, I think Professor Via also mentioned AI, many of you also mentioned the AI issue. Now the AI is cross-cutting issue, not just only discipline for the computer science. We have to think about AI in the whole, all discipline. Now Bangladesh has started a so-called uh, Bangladesh Digital University. And then now they put in the AI element in all discipline. So we are also working that. For example, even common sector, we are working that way. So now we try to go beyond the traditional boundary of education. That stimulate new thinking in the education. Uh, now the I think the uh, the president Otto also mentioned about that importance. The water management, even water management, can be very important area we can think about. The how do we really optimize water management? How do we address the uh, climate change angle in the water 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 sector water resource management? Uh, water uh, management also sometimes we very much focus on only rural water, but how do we really rethinking about water as a whole, right? From whole cycle, life cycle of water, you know, water conservation, even forest, even the utilization. When you come to even the energy sector, we are now the issue is that climate change issue, but clean energy, but we also talk about digital uh, energy. How we really address the uh, digital energy and then decentralization and also client centric uh, digital uh, energy issue. With the current uh, usual uh, current program, it's very difficult we can deal with. Now the, the, the energy sector people, they have to perhaps work with uh, the uh, computer or in the other sector people. Same as transport, we are talking about e-mobility. Traditional transport export cannot deal with this problem. We need to work with now uh, the, 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 the energy people and also the urban people redesign our cities. So there's so many issues. So that's a big challenge to the uh, education, but solution is with us. You know, we are, many people look up education now, as the Professor Kong also mentioned, 
he already come up with some solution, you know, compensing from the elementary the, all the way to the, uh, the higher education, also beyond even higher education. I think the, uh, uh, the vice president Suchida mentioned of a very interesting idea called one ID system <laughs> from the elementary school the, all the way to, uh, you know, alumni. That is perhaps one of the solutions we are talking. I'm so much excited to hear a lot of the innovative approach from the, uh, the, the, the eminent uh, panelists today. Thank you. Over to you, Santi. Thank you. Thank you, Song Sook. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask then, uh, Professor Suchia, like, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, micro credentials. So, you know, we, we're thinking about, like, you have, you have cohorts, like, you're tracking, like, the whole life cycle, like, the study life cycle of students. So, what do you, what's your take on the future of micro credentials that can, you know, over time link up to a qualification. So that also gives flexibility to students to, to package their learning in different ways. Yes, um, we are thinking about this because, so one big problem for Japan is that our population is aging and shrinking. So we are reducing the number of the people inside Japan. So the two ways for um, university to survive. So we have uh, um, recurrent education, so uh, recurrent learning. So it means that so more older people, people coming back to universities, but it, 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 it's not um, good enough. So we want to have more international students coming to Japan. So um, I, I do not deny any um, digital learning um, uh, advantages. So I'm professor of cybersecurity. I know uh, information technology very well. But after doing distance learning for the past two years, we learned that education is has a more broader sense. So extracurricular activities like sports and the culture is a very important part of campus life. So we offered full um, um, online um, courses for the past two years, but so the still the international students are frustrated. Um, so they wanted to come to Japan. So they wanted to taste food, um, festivals, sports, and other um, uh, parts of the cultures. So uh, we have to have such kind of activities on campus and outside of campus. So uh, micro credentials, uh, it's a good idea. So we want to offer such courses uh, for uh, adult alumni or other uh, foreign students. So this will be the future. So we want to have um, in, in terms of management of university. So we need more revenue sources. So in a shrinking aging society. So we want to have offer something new um, outside uh, the uh, traditional curriculum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if I can request uh, Susanna to, uh, to briefly come in and talk about, uh, you know, your idea of how, um, you know, unique schools can be created, like, you know, which combine maybe, like, you know, you talked about STEM and now it expanded to STEAM. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, Professor Kong talked about STEM C. So would you like to share some thoughts briefly on how you see the future of this? Um, okay, thanks very much, uh, Shanti. I think I will share a little bit um, more about um, our thinking with regards to how we um, implement interdisciplinarity uh, um, in terms of um, the changes or the redesigning of our curriculum uh, so we so we understand that you know students need to connect the dots more because we know that the the kind of problems that they will face are, are going to be very complex and i think this has been mentioned over and over again uh, and in order for them to come up with the solutions we need to broaden their exposure uh, at the same time, we need to ensure that they have certain depth in terms of the domain knowledge. So there is a tension here uh, uh, in terms of the balance that we need to achieve, both in terms of the broadness of the curriculum, at the same time, the depth of the curriculum. Um, 
And there are different ways to think about it. Um, uh, traditionally, we, we are very much focused on specialization. Uh, and so the major is very significant uh, because we want a lot of depth. So, um, so, so we are moving away from that because we are now trying to tear down subject silos by reducing a bit of the depth, broadening the, 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 um, the curriculum, and maybe even extend that um, uh, by not, not doing too much of front loading of the curriculum in the undergraduate days, but extend it beyond undergraduate by virtue of continuing education. So these are the various models that we are thinking. But at this point in time, we have redesigned our curriculum to increase the, 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 the breadth, all right, and provide flexibility within all right, the curriculum for different aspirations of, uh, for different students with different aspirations. So those who still want to pursue, for example, to become an engineer, they will um, be able to satisfy the depth within this very flexible curriculum which we have designed. At the same time, we allow for those that would want to do just the core of the engineering, but want to be exposed to, for example, another major, all right? For example, in computing, all right? Um, and, and that is also possible within this very flexible uh, curriculum that we have uh, redesigned. So we have done that for engineering and design. We have done that for sciences and humanities. And we are extending it now to business, computing, and the rest of the disciplines by gradually tearing down the subject silos and then broadening it. And then continuing education is the concept in which our students will continuously return. So our students will finish a program with us but they never really graduate from the university. So they will always be able to come back because we are providing these bite-sized um, uh, 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 micro-credentials that, uh, that we have been talking about in order for them to continuously overlay their, their, their knowledge so that they can pivot as their roles change when the macro environment changes. So thank these you. are some of the things that we are thinking about and doing now. Yeah, Great. thank you. Thank much. you so much. It was like very illustrative and very concrete and very concrete examples. Thank you very much for sharing that. We're really uh, kind of running out of time. So, but I still want to get a couple of questions to uh, Professor Via and Professor Kong, but very briefly, uh, you know, the question to you, Professor Via, is, uh, you know, the online learning could, could perhaps more easily be tailored to IT and engineering, but how about other allied courses? Is, uh, is that equally easy to extend online learning for other disciplines? Um, well, I think maybe uh, for other disciplines, uh, it could also be easy. In fact, it is difficult in uh, programs where you have laboratories. Although we have, you know, laboratory simulation software, but it's not quite the same as uh, doing experiments in the lab itself. So in fact, it may be easier, you know, for say social sciences to do uh, online learning. Uh, our school got uh, approval from our Commission on Higher Education to offer fully online programs way beyond the pandemic, in fact, for an indefinite period. And uh, we chose IT, we chose industrial engineering, not too much lab. We chose electrical engineering. We know there are solutions that have been made by other schools in terms of the laboratory, we chose electronics engineering, but we could not do it for mechanical engineering. So it will really depend on the, uh, the assessment of the school. But I would say that if there are no laboratories involved, then it's a candidate, a very good candidate for being uh, transformed into fully online programs or having a fully online version of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's like that's so you outlined the feasibility of doing that. Thank you. And, uh, last, I would like to uh, turn to Professor Kong. So, a question to you is like I you know a little bit more about how the Education University of Hong Kong is looking at the three plus one program for the acquisition of bachelor's and master's degrees with uh, with the Chinese universities. If you can uh, talk about that a little bit, uh, in very briefly, since we are kind of yeah. all, already out of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Santi. So. Um, 
If three plus one means uh, the undergrad, we are working with um, the South China Normal University and Beijing Normal University, and the uh, curriculum is very, um, uh, uh, very uh, uh, nice. And uh, uh, and they can squeeze one year to work with EUHK for, for example, Master of Education. So three plus one is the way out after a long time study between the three universities, so that their students can study uh, the undergrad in their university, but they can join a UHK to gain a master degree as well. So uh, one more thought uh, about the lifelong learning um, framework. We at UHK uh, are developing uh, uh, in uh, 10 years ago, it's about the e-portfolio, university reflection and the gyro, that is a generic internal learning outcome on problem solving and so on and so forth. We integrate all these components into every single course. That means lifelong learning is not using a single course, but actually it is in field into all 120 credit points they're going to acquire. All these um, capabilities should be integrated in all the coursework. So they make sure all the teaching staff know that they are not just teaching subjects uh, stuff. Actually, they have to develop in certain aspects the uh, generic competency of the students. So when they graduate, they become a lifelong learner. So that is something that we are doing uh, for the time being. Thank you, Santi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I see that there, there are more questions that we may not be able to answer, but maybe uh, the panelists can put in some responses in the Q&A box. But since we are uh, out of time, so I'd like to, uh, I, I think each of you could have spoken to us for the entire time. We, you have so much, so much knowledge and depth that we could have just had each of you uh, for that entire period. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak with you and I, and I hope we will continue the conversation. But uh, now I'd like to uh, uh, turn the floor to Brajesh Pant. Uh, Brajesh Pant is the chief of the ADB's education sector group and he leads uh, ADB's policies and strategies um, in, the, in the education sector. Uh, I'd like to invite him to give closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Shanti. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Shanti, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Rajesh. Okay. Uh, I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the panel discussion, uh, which reflected how the emerging challenges are compounded by the pandemic and the need to be more strategic. The good, good thing is that we are moving towards greater convergence in terms of priorities, approaches, and collaboration. The discussions highlighted several complementary issues, such as the shifting nature of the labor market and its implications on the future of work in an increasingly volatile and uncertain environment, and how higher education has been disrupted by the pandemic. The pandemic has shown that we need to rethink the role of universities and how this can be done we heard how universities can be more innovative and agile in addressing social and economic problems while developing innovative mindset of uh, learners. Then there is a critical issue about how to ensure a continuous pool of well-prepared and motivated learners from the school systems to enter university education. As DG Bruno and Sung Su pointed out, ADB is prioritizing uh, fighting climate change and digital transformation to critical areas that cut across these areas and there is a growing momentum globally, we see a deeper role of universities in two major aspects. First, as the panel discussions reinforce, universities are very well placed to promote interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral approaches to prepare the graduates with solid foundational skills combined with 21st century skills such as creativity, critical thinking, and so on, and entrepreneurship. Uh, Second, universities also uh, are well placed to enhance capacity of priority areas such as uh, green skills, digital skills, and workforce development, focusing on emerging priorities such as education workforce, health workforce, agricultural and rural transformation, infrastructure development, and management, among others. There is also growing consensus on the need to bring the private sector and employers in, in much bigger and practical ways to support government reforms in reform initiatives such as universal health care, education for all, digital transformation, and sustainable development to prepare future workers, entrepreneurs, 
and leaders. As DG Bruno mentioned, the share of higher education in the education portfolio uh, is growing significantly at ADB, which reflects the growth that the region has seen in the past 50 years and how the region is transforming. Uh, our annual lending is uh, around 1 billion or 5% of total lending uh, currently, but we are redoubling our efforts to increase the annual lending to up to 10% of total ADB lending in the next few years. Finally, we heard several examples of collaboration. We'd like to build on this and explore how ADB can support a network of advanced universities to collaborate with developing universities in the region to provide viable options to our developing member countries to raise the quality and standards of teaching, learning, and research in more seamless ways to address emerging priorities. This way, universities as key learning organizations can facilitate and accelerate the uh, kind of transformation we are, that we are all looking at. Let me thank the uh, distinguished panelists, colleagues, particip participants, and organizers for a great session. And of course, Santi, uh, this, this was a very well organized and very uh, uh, timely uh, uh, discussion. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajesh. And uh, our apologies that we couldn't get to all the questions, but maybe we can find a way uh, for some of the unanswered questions to revert to you uh, uh, subsequently. And, and apologies to my colleagues, ADB colleagues, that some of their questions were not uh, aired either. Uh, but I hope that some of the panelists, we can invite them back to our coffee sessions on a, on a sort of a group uh, kind of a discussion. And I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining today. And thanks to Samsup, thanks to all the panelists and to Brajesh uh, for uh, helping us uh, deliver this program. And uh, uh, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Please Thank take you. care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, thank you, Sandy.